The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Everybody, welcome to the swerve. I'm here with a guy that I've been trying to get on forever, but because he's a computer illiterate, uh, it's taken us seven years. Because, uh, Pat, Pat, you would have been my first guest. I, I, you would have been my very first guest. It's taken years to be able for you. Oh, who did, who uses Skype? You should FaceTime. Everyone uses FaceTime. No, bro. I Skype or I Google Hangout. Bro, can I do the formal introduction of you, please, before we start talking about Van Halen? Everybody, this is one of my best friends in the business, Irish Pat Barrett. You know Miss Simon Diamond. I hate the Simon Diamond name. Oh, I've you always call me Irish Pat Barrett. Irish Pat Barrett. Bro, but are you and I the only two people who know who Irish Pat Barrett is? He wrote the book. Irish Pat Barrett. Victor. No, wrote, what was the book he wrote? Everybody Down Here Hates Me? Something like that. Do you yeah. remember who his tag team partner was? Uh, Victor Rivera. Bam. All right, everybody, listen. Irish Pat Kenny, the Irishman, uh, Simon Diamond. I hate the name Simon Diamond. Well, yeah, you hated that name. My best friend in the business. The, that was the, all Paul Heyman's idea. Bro, so. why are you the only guy? After 20 years, why are you the only guy that's still call you? You and Glenn Gilbanetti are the only two guys that call me. Nobody else calls me anymore but the two of you. Why, explain to me why. Why, why do you call Vince Russo I, when he could do absolutely nothing for your career? I, <clears throat> I think a lot of that happens in the wrestling business. It's like the mafia. Um, it's a lot like the wrestling business. It's the mafia. Hold on, bro. Here we go again. <laughs> Here we go again. Um. It's a lot. It's a lot like the mafia. When guys leave, they die, and you're not supposed to talk about them. And that's it. Yeah. But you know, bro, I, you know me, I've always, I, I'm different. I, you know, I, 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 like, I was just telling my daughter the other day to be different. You know, be different. That's all. Just be different. Yeah, and I, and I think Pat, we got way too much in common outside of wrestling that we always talk about anyway. But bro, there's a couple things I want to talk to you about. You're the perfect person to talk about as it relates to wrestling and and it's coming off of i watched raw last night bro listen i have to watch raw for three hours because i get paid to do a show i would who was the who was the uh ecw guy that's what i that's what i want to talk about bro the fourth guy was rhino okay, okay. listen irish you were there at ecw Mm -hmm. With nobody, nobody is going to question or argue that ECW left a mark on the world. There'll never be another ECW. Very important to the wrestling business. A piece of history. Nobody is ever going to challenge that. But I got to be honest with you, bro. I'm watching the show last night, and they're all my friends. They're all my friends. Bubba, Devon, Tommy. And uh, and Rhino, you know, they come out and, you know, they're ECW, the whole nine yards. And, bro, like for the first time, I got to be honest with you, Pat, uh, they're my friends. But for the first time, like I'm kind of sitting there and I'm saying like to myself, yeah, enough with the ECW thing already. Like, like really? And, and And I think I'm in a position where I could say that, Pat, because if I was working for WCW now today, Bro, I would not be carting out wrestlers from the Attitude Era. You know, I, I, I would not be, be trotting out DX. You know, bring Shawn Michaels back, put Hunter. I wouldn't be doing that. It's like we've been there and we've done that. Now, we, we've listen, we even did the ECW reunion gimmick at TNA. But even that, bro, looking back now, that was six, seven years ago. And yep. this was really for the first time. And Bub is my buddy. I'm like, all right, enough with ECW already. Pat, how do you feel about that? Having been there, an original, done that. How, I mean, how do you feel about here we are, 2015, 15 years later, and it's kind of still being carted out? I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy for Bubba and Devon and Dreamer. And I'm happy for Rhino. For it gets him back on the spotlight, which will help him, you know, with his business, which is Rhino. Um, <clears throat> I just think that ECW was, it was an innovative product. Um, it changed wrestling. But we we need to move on. 
the, the wrestling industry, it needs to move on from that. It just, um, <clears throat> I know why they're doing it because they're trying to find something to stick. They're throwing things against the wall and they're trying to find something to stick. So I don't think that they really know what it is that they want to do. So they're trying to find something that sticks. Um, <clears throat> you well, know, well, well, but it's a, it's a, it's a nostalgia act, yeah. you know, it's a nostalgia act. You bring it in, um, you know, and then y- y- you got to make a decision again, who are we getting over here? Are we going to get these guys over? Are we going to get our new young talent who we've invested all this time and money into? What are we going to do? Well, Pat, let me ask you about that because man, it seems every time like the WWE hits a low point. Oh, Flair's going to be on the show next week. Shawn Michaels is going to be on the show next week. Now, now we got, you know, they, they, they go to, you know, they go to what they know is money in the bank and they go to, you know, what they know is going to draw ratings. And every time they need it, whether it's an ECW, whether it's an attitude there or whatever, they, they dig back in the well and they pull it out. Pat, why can't they get new stars over? What I mean, you you and I have this conversation to nauseam. But you know, you know, we don't have this combination with everybody else. So let me hear your spin on it. Well, number one, I think it is the fact that, <clears throat> like I said earlier, they're a slave to the stockholder, and they're a slave. More importantly, they're a slave to the television network that they're on. And I think that. A lot of times bringing these guys back into the fold is a knee-jerk reaction that's not part of the process. And when you do that, you upset the process and you you upset the growth of the company. Because when you bring those guys back, that takes television time away from somebody somewhere. So by doing that, you're not going to have that continuity. Um, The other thing I believe 100% is it's – you know, some of these guys are <clears throat> overexposed on on a, you know, on a show. They come out two and three times, and by the third time they come out, done, and it's just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. Um, you know, as far as the characters themselves, you know, a lot of the guys look the same, a lot of the guys <clears throat> wrestle the same, um, and I'm talking about the, what I've seen on the WWE. A lot of the guys look the same. A lot of guys wrestle the same. <clears throat> and only a few guys stand out. And only a few guys are written to stand out. That's the other part. So, Pat, give me an argument. Because you and I have this discussion all the time because it was a part of the game that you and I loved. And we still talk about the art of it to this day. Give me an argument. It's 2015. Yes. Give me an argument why the vignette, the oh. four to six week introduction of a new character, give me an argument why, okay, it's 2015, so that would never work today. Give, give me an argument why. Okay. <clears throat> so do you have, do you have Showtime? Uh, no, I don't. Do you have Stars, any of those? Yeah, 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 yeah. So – we were watching, my wife and I were watching Stars one night and we saw a 30 second promo to introduce a new show called um, Flesh and Bone, I think it's called. It's about the it's about the ballet. <clears throat> so I said, Well, that looks pretty interesting. Then a couple days later, we see another one. Oh, now we're now our interest has really peaked a little bit. Couple days before it's first, it starts. They're <clears throat> in between each movie or each whatever. It's they're they're nailing this thing. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Now we're hooked. It's so simple. If you introduce the character before he steps into the ring, then everybody knows who he is, what he's about, and what he stands for. As he's walking down the aisle for the first time. So now you get the correct correct reaction the first time he's in the ring. And what's the most important impression to make? The first. Pat, here's the thing. I'm always trying to... 
I'm always trying to make excuses for them. I'm because I'm always trying to understand. It's like you said, Pat. It's real simple. So I'm always trying to understand if it's real simple. Why aren't they doing it? Why are they? Here's Neville. Here's Ascension. Here's Owens. Here's Tyler Breeze. And nobody has gotten over. Nobody is close to getting over. Pat, try to explain to me why is it so simple, but yet why are they not doing it? I don't know why they're not doing it. Um, you know, T, you know, TNA does it. We do it a little bit. We, we do it better than they do. We have vignettes where you, you know, you get to see, you know, the character side. Um, me, is it because the writers there don't think these guys can pull it off? Is it Pat, can I tell you what I, what I think part of the problem is? I, I think part of the problem is, and this is a big mistake on the part of the WWE, I think they've gotten into a routine, bro, where this show is written much like Nitro was written with Eric Bischoff, literally the day of. Jeez. I never thought I would say that with the WWE and Vince McMahon, that the show would be written the day of. There's a lot of that going on. And when you get into that formula, bro, and that habit, the vignettes are pre-planning. They're pre-planning. Bro. If you can't pre-plan them, you're never going to have them. It was the process. You got to have you got to have a process in place. You have to trust that process and you have to let it play out for anything to be successful. That's anything. Um and if, if then that does, then they don't trust the process. So then the process is wrong. You got to get rid of it. Pat, here's another thing, man. I, I'm I'm sure you didn't watch last night's show, right? No. Okay, Pat, you got you 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 got to explain this to me. I'm watching last night's show now. Pat, keep in mind we're six days away from the pay per view. Pat, yes. you and I both know. Obviously, the pay per view model has changed. They're not going to get their fifty five dollars. It isn't the same that it was fifteen years ago. We understand that, but they're still trying to drive the people to the WWE network. They want to get subscribers to the network. The pay per view is going to be on the network. Pat, we're six days away from the pay per view. A three-hour show. Oh. Bro, none of the heels left with any heat. No, no, I, none of them. Pat, can you explain? Bro, oh. the business was built on you heat on the heels, heat on the heels, heat on the heels. Pay, heat it, on off the heels. The Pay it off at the pay-per-view. The baby faces get their uh, comments, up comments, whatever you call it. Bro, not one heel it got... The only heels that went over were the ones going up to take over that top spot. Right. What happened? What, what what happened? I don't know. I, is <clears throat> is it almost has it almost flipped? I've thought of this too. Has it almost flipped now because people don't order the pay per views like they used to? Right. Oh, so is the TV more accentuated towards get you know allowing the baby face to win, and then now the the payoff. For watching the pay-per-view is the heel goes over. Is that what they're doing? I mean, I don't... I don't know, bro, but they're still trying to drive people to their network. You know, I mean, you know, I, I, I still think in today's society, we do want the good guy to win. You know, it's, I had this conversation the other day um, with a friend of mine, and his son watches wrestling, and he was, you know, he used to watch it. Um, he's a little younger than I am. Um and I was explaining to him what I think is the problem with wrestling. I basically believe you have um, the majority of the people that watch wrestling today, I would say 75% are hardcore wrestling fans, aware of the internet, aware of you know the, the inner workings of the business. Then there's 25% who would be considered a casual fan. And of that 25%, I'd say 80% are under the age of 13. And the quadrum is, what do you do? Who do you appeal to? Do you, do you appeal to that hardcore fan base, which wants to see wrestling as an Olympic sport, pro wrestling as an Olympic sport, where it's athleticism and, you know, all that stuff? Or do you try to build up that casual fan base and turn off your hardcore fan? And I, I think the thing with the hardcore fan is they have a certain um, 
ownership of the wrestling business where they don't want the casual fan in there because they believe the casual fan upsets what they want to see. So they they are vocal. Even at the live events, they are vocal um, to, towards the casual fan that their thought process is wrong. You, you don't cheer for the, the good guy, you know. Um, I took my nephew to an indie show over the summer. Um, he wanted to meet um, one of the guys on the show um, who was a big name. I'm not going to mention who it was. So, Glengo, uh, Glengo Birdie? <clears throat> so I knew this certain person. So, um, you know, I said, uh, talk to him. And then I talked to the promoter of the show. I said, you know, my nephew's starting to get into wrestling and – you know, I want to take him to a show. He's never been to a show. So I want to bring him back, you know, and meet some of the guys. Sure, no problem. So then, you know, I'm, I want to watch some of these matches. I'm still a fan, you know. So we're out there, and uh, my little nephew, Charlie, is is cheering for the good guys. And this guy who was somewhat close to him, you know, um, turns to me. And this guy's about uh, 20, I'm going to say late 20s maybe. Backpack, you know, glasses are like the, you know, the deal, bro. <laughs> you know, he's got his folder of you know, eight by ten. So he starts talking to me, you know, and he recognized me or whatever. And uh, he says, "What? Why is your uh, little nephew uh, cheering for the good guys?" I said, he's just, "He doesn't, you know, he's pure. He's a pure wrestling fan, like we all were when we were young." He says, "Yeah, but you should teach him." I said, "What? What, what do you mean? I should teach him? What am I going to teach him?" He says, you know, who's good and who's not? I said to him, good is good and bad is bad. It's black and white. That's what professional wrestling should be. And he says, no, you should, you know, you should teach him who's a good worker. Oh, and I said, what's that? What do you mean? A good, you know, what do you mean? And he said, you know, the guys who can wrestle. And I said, well, a good worker and a good wrestler are not the same thing. Well, what do you mean? I said, a good worker gets the most out of the least. That's a good worker. So is that what you're talking about? Or you're talking about who's the most athletic, who's able to do an offensive exhibition that he cannot understand. He doesn't understand that. He understands good versus evil. He understands the characters. That's what he understands. You know, and I was just, I mean, this guy was, he was brutal, bro. God, bro. And then, bro, he shattered me the rest of the night with his questions. Irish, how hard was it to understand when when Spiros Arion turned on Chief J and shoved his his his, his ceremonial headdress down his throat, how they, hard how hard was that to understand? Oh, they did that same angle in Georgia with Ernie Ladd and Jay Strongbow. They did the same thing, bro. How hard was it to understand when Peter, the High Chief Peter Maivia, turned on Bob Backlund? Do you remember that? Yes. And how great that angle was. And Backlund's in the ring, and he's getting, you know, they're working him over. And he tur as soon as he turns to tag Maya Villa, Maya Villa jumps down and starts talking to Arnold Scullin. And then Backlund now, now they beat him up a little bit more. And then, again, <clears throat> he turns, and Maya Villa's on the floor again talking to Scullin. And you're watching this, and you understand it so clearly because it's so easy to understand. It's so easy to understand. It's just black and white. Bro, how hard was it for understand? for us to understand when the wizard would tell us what superstar Billy Graham was going to do to Bruno. How hard was that for us to understand, bro? Bro, <laughs> it was, you know, you have no <laughs> chance, Mr. <laughs> San Martino. You're looking at the superstar, the greatest athlete in the world, and let your eyes do the walking and, <laughs> and you beat him. Because the answer is simple, no. Irish, can you explain to the people, but there was a big match uh, at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> can you explain to the, to the people why the Wizard uh, was allowed to stay ringside for the match? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I've just been informed by referee John... I can't remember his name. <laughs> John Swanigan... <laughs> The Grand Wizard of Wrestling will be allowed to remain at ringside as long as he behaves. <laughs> Bro, you know what's so funny, Irish? We're here oh, like to... Tell the, tell the story of the, Al Grando Wizardo. 
Oh, bro. Bro, you know what's so funny? Bro, here we are, me and you. If you combine our ages, we're over 100 years old combined. <laughs> we, bro, we are two of the guys that everybody on the internet, you know what they would call us? Me more than you because you're still active in the business. We're irrelevant, bro. We're irrelevant. I have no problem with that. <laughs> oh, my God. Bro, bro. What, bro, what would happen? Listen to me. Next Monday Night Raw, the show opens. Rather than the authority come out, oh, right, bro? What oh. happens if to the ring come the Grand Wizard of Wrestling, oh. Captain Lou, oh. and Classy Freddie Blassie, bro? Three wise men of the East. Uh, I, I'm sure you would. T my phone would be ringing off the hook. I would grab the controller from Candace, and I would turn <laughs> it on. Or I'd run down in the man cave and turn it on, and I would sit there watching like this. Because those three guys mm. are what sold tickets back in the day. And, bro, go back and watch all of that on YouTube because I do it all the time. Pat, you know what I say, bro? He, this is what I say. People that put wrestling today over. And, bro, I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying WWE. Yeah. People, people that put the WWE today over. This, this, this is what I have to say in order to accept it. They never saw what we saw, Pat, because if they saw what we saw, there's no way they could be putting today's product over. They, they, they're oblivious to what we experienced. It's just, it's a whole nother level. It's a whole nother level. The care, you know, when I hear people talk about um, Heyman as a manager, and Heyman's very good as a manager, but he, he can't hold a candle. No. To the Grand Wizard, as far as promo skills, he can't hold a candle. I mean, the Wizard, it, they, it was per him and, and Graham was the perfect act mm -hmm. because Graham looked the part, and then the Wizard looked the part of the spindly little guy who you wanted to grab his neck and shake him, but you never got to him because the big guy standing behind him always stepped in front. But the and the Wizard would just he'd needle you and needle you and needle you. Have no opportunity, <laughs> you know. And his the, the spit would be flying, uh, and he had to wrap around. I mean, he looked ridiculous, uh, but played the part to the T. To uh, T. Blassi played the part to the T. Albano played. These guys played. They looked the part. They played the part. They sound the part. You know. Check well, the you, know, you, you know what else though, bro? Here's a key thing. They believed it. They, they weren't. They believed uh, Ernie, it. The Grand Wizard of Wrestling was not Ernie Roth. He was the Grand Wizard of Wrestling 24-7. Yeah. That, that's the other thing that's missing today in the business is, you know, these guys go on Twitter, uh, they go on social media, and they become the regular person, and it kills. You know, you know what I would love to see in today's – you know what I would love to see? I would love to see a heel cut off all social media access, don't do interviews, don't sign autographs, be old school. I would love to see that because I would love – just as a test. Yeah. Just as a test to see what would happen. What would be the action? Yeah. Irish, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I don't think you're going to like this line of questioning. Uh oh. But I've been thinking a lot about this because I knew, I knew, you know, you, you were hopefully coming on the show this week. Okay. It's the Van Halen discussion. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I, listen, I, I'm, I'm being dead serious about this. Sure. You know me growing up. Kiss was yes. to me what Van Halen was to you, yeah. but but here's the here, here's 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 my question, bro. Kiss was to me what Van Halen is to you because Gene Simmons, as the demon, with with heels that he was over a seven footer, and the chrome and the armor and the makeup. Pat, I'll never forget this as a kid. There was a poster of Gene, and it was shot from the floor looking like that. And he had the blood down. Yes. He had his arms up like that. I had the T-shirt. Okay. Had... That poster, Pat, was above my bed growing up. And every time I walked into my room, I would look at that poster, and there was nothing I couldn't do because of just the power. You know, the, the, okay? I, I, so you understand what I'm saying. Here's where I'm a little confused with you and the van halen love okay bro david lee roth was a sex symbol 
He was a sex symbol. He wore the tightest clothes you could find. And the girls went crazy for him. He was a legitimate sex symbol. Mm -hmm. Where, where, where did the connection? Because to me, like Van Halen should have been more for the teenage girls. They, they, you know, they, they wanted to see the tight. They wanted to see the tight leotards on David Lee Roth. The show David Lee Roth put on. Where, how, where was the appeal? So the first time I ever heard Van Halen, my Uncle John, um, he said, <clears throat> we had to go around the corner. We were with my grandmother's, and we had to go around the corner to get something. I don't remember what it was. He says, right. he says why don't you come with me? I, w- I want you to hear some. So we get in the car, and he pops the 8-track in. 8-track, bro. 8-track, yep. yep. And he says, Listen to this. And he turns it up. And it's eruption. And I'm like... Are there UFOs landing on the car? What is it? What what is this? And he says it's Van Halen. So even the name sounds like this rock, this gigantic like monster is going to come out of the ground and take over the world. And then I start. So then he starts playing it more and more. And the 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 magic of Van Halen is this: you heard it, it was different. There's that word again, different. You heard it, it was different. And then I went home and saw it on MTV. And I see, you know, this guy with long blonde hair jumping all over the place. And I see this guy with this guitar that looks like it was, you know, he pulled it out of a volcano. And it's making these sounds that no one's ever made before with it. And just the the entire package was perfect. And then there was the music. Oh, by the way, there was the music. And they were selling an edge. They were selling a powerful, edgy um, it was a, it was like a, you know, punch. It was a, it was hard. It had an edge to it. Um, it was the perfect package. The look, they, but David Lee Roth, the thing about David Lee Roth was he was a sex symbol to the girls, but he was selling sex as an overall thing. So to me as a teenage kid interested in girls and David Lee Roth sitting up there saying, well, let's, you know, this is, this shit's fun. Let's have sex with a lot of people. I was like, all right, yeah, I want to do that. Cool. I, Irish, listen, I'm going to ask you a very pivotal question here in our relationship. <laughs> here we go. Who was a better front man, David Lee Roth or Freddie Mercury? Freddie Mercury. Okay, thank you. He's the greatest. Freddie, I've always said that. Freddie okay, Mercury is the greatest. greatest front man. He, oh my God. Pat, can I tell you another? Pat, you know, a couple more things. I'm not done with the Van Halen line of questioning yet. Here's another thing I never liked about Van Halen. Now, I'm not saying I'm not a Van Halen fan because they are great, 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 great showmen. And you know I love that above everything else. But here's where you and I differ on a couple of things. I want to pick your brain a little bit. I never never understood the covers. David Lee Roth designed them all. No, I'm no, 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 no. I'm talking about the the, the covering of old songs. I, I I never liked that them covering old songs. Well, they covered. Let's see. Let's go. So they did. You really got me on the first one, right? Yeah. They jumped. Um, pretty one. Wo- pretty woman. Diver Down was the big, but that was a that was a contractual issue because they had to get the album out. So that was that was the beginning. Diver Down was the beginning of the. Well, no, Fair Warning was the beginning of the end of Van Halen. Diver Down heightened it. And then 1984 was that was it. So <clears throat> fair warning, Eddie starts um, playing around with the synthesizer, right? And when he starts playing around with the synthesizer, David Lee's telling him, "People don't want to hear you play the synthesizer. You're a guitar god. Play the guitar." So now Diver Down comes along, <clears throat> right? And the record company is leaning on them for a album and Roth comes to the band and says, let's do these covers. Let's do dance in the streets. Let's do pretty woman. Um, what was the other one they did? I think. Where have all the good times gone? Is that, was that a cover? Anyway, they start doing diver down was the big cover, but you know, diver down had some great songs on it. Secrets, little guitars, yeah, uh, full bug. They had some, you know, good stuff. And then once they started doing the covers, you know, that's when, um, Eddie and David butted heads, and then 1984, you know, with with synthesizers and jump, and then that's when Eddie started to try to take control of the band, and Roth left. 
Let me ask you, Irish. This is very, very important now. Uh, no. Listen, bro. David Lee Roth is a superstar. Bona fides, <laughs> bro. He has the top guy. five front man of all time. Maybe top three. Yeah, give, give me top five. Who, who? When you say top five, Pat, who are you thinking of? Freddie Mercury's number one. Um, David Lee Roth is in the top five. Robert Plant is in the top five. Morrison didn't have the charisma of the other guys. Uh Jagger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. How can we forget Mick? And then the fifth spot, I think, is a you know a bunch of guys. All right, but I, 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 I listen, bro. David Lee Roth is one of the guys that I say larger than life, larger than life person. I love, bro. He had the greatest line of all time, better than the Wizard. Uh, classy Freddie Blassie, anybody, when he says uh, Sammy Hagar goes to the party, I am the party. I, am. I love True. that. True. Bro, I love that. But he is, he, he is, he is my big question to you as a, a, a Van Halen fanatic. Bro, if I'm a big Van Halen fan, when David Lee Roth gets eliminated and Sammy Hagar gets put in that spot, I'm, I may be done. I, I may be done at that point because, bro, you don't replace a David Lee Roth. Pat, I think there was only one successful replacement of a lead singer. or a, and Here's another great man in the history of the wrestling business. I think the only time when it was successfully done. Was, I enjoyed yes, that's it. That's great. it. Bro, great. how did you – when they took – Oh, it was brutal. Yeah, but how did how what made you go on with them? Because of Eddie, you know. But I didn't stick. I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you what happened. So fifty. So my senior year in high school. So I remember watching MTV and and Kurt Loder comes on and says, you know, David Lee Roth has left the band and Sammy. Hay. And I was like, what? The, I can't drive fifty five guy. No, that's terrible. Now my friends are calling me. You know, and I'm free. I'm you know we're all freaking out. We can't believe this. So then that senior year. I go, you know, I buy 5150, and it's got a couple good songs on it. You know, it's, it still has that old Van Halen sound. You know, now Alex is getting into the electronic drum, drums a little bit. And, you know, what's it? Love Comes Walking In, uh, you know, a couple other Kabuki-ish songs. But, you know, we got 5150, uh, Best of Both Worlds, and Summer Nights. We're all, you know, good Van Halen-y songs. So I go see him in concert with three friends of mine, one, one who died in 9-11, John Murray, got rest soul. And that was like the, our last get together before we go off to college because we're all going. Two of my friends went to BC, another one went to St. Joe's. I went to VCU. Um, so then I go to VCU, and <clears throat> um, second baseman Blair Wood and one of our pitchers, Matt Mayer, big Van Halen fans. Now David Lee Roth's album comes out. David Lee Roth sounds more like Van Halen to me than Van Halen. So now we go see David Lee Roth. And we're in the parking lot, <clears throat> and this guy is going around, and he's selling T-shirts. And on the front, it says, F, star, 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 Eddie Van Halen. And on the back, it said, I'm with David Lee Roth. And I bought one. I bought one, bro. Richmond Coliseum. I bought one. So, so, but so, but, but, then, but here's, here was my disconnect with Sammy. So then the next album comes out, OU812, and they go on this Monsters of Rock tour outdoor deal. Uh, Metallica, Scorpions, uh, Kingdom Come, I think, was one of the opening acts. Anyway, so it's a JF, the old JFK in Philly. And I go with some friends of mine, and we get, I mean, rip-roaring drunk. You know, it's 88, I think, or 89. And uh, it was that summer. And it was like 100 and – it was like 102. It was brutal. JFK, they would let you go in and out of the building. You know, you could go in and then go back to your car. So I go back to the car and I pass out through Metallica's set and the Scorpion set. And I wake up, you know, as they're setting up Van Halen. Van Halen comes out. They sounded horrendous. Horrendous. Awful. Terrible. Awful. And that was it for me with Sammy Hagar. I was like, oh, this is terrible. I'm done. I'm done. And that was 80. And that was along the time that Guns N' Roses was coming along and I was digging that sound. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of got in there. But I saw him on the reunion. 
I saw him on the 2007 reunion tour. I thought, saw him in 2012. I saw him this year um, at the Susquehanna Bank Center at Camden with two of the guys, the other two living guys that I went to see him with in 1986. So do you still follow David Lee Roth? Yes. Yeah. Most certainly. Yeah. All right, Irish, I, let, let, let's turn another love of yours, okay? The New York Yankees, you know. Oh. Reggie Jackson, the whole nine yards. Bro, I, here's what I'm having a hard time with. How can – you would never in a million years think that Hal Steinbrenner is the son of oh. George Steinbrenner. I, I, I don't understand it, bro. Listen, you and I are huge marks for baseball. We got the winter meetings. Oh. But the, the fact that the Yankees are not even in any conversations, it's almost like it's not baseball. It's not. It's if the Yankees aren't involved of these big names, their names are never even brought up anymore, bro. How can a son come along and completely change the philosophy of a dynasty that his own old man built? How hard is it to remain a Yankee fan? There's only one George Steinbrenner. The reason why they won was because of him and nobody else. It wasn't the players. It was because of him. Um, <clears throat> Hank and Hal are – they're horrendous. But they turn the team over to Cashman. Cashman runs the team now. I mean, he makes all the decisions. They stick by him. But what's the problem, bro? They got money. The Yankees have but money. Different now. They don't – Cashman – and I agree with this. He's saying we have to build, build internally. We can't just start signing guys because – Next thing you know, we're going to be 400, 400 million payroll. You know, he wants to be under, you know, what is it, 190 or something. Um, but I agree with that. Yeah, boy. Bro, you got – here's he, here's the deal, and I've been saying this for years because you've heard me say it to you. <clears throat> Baseball now is draft guys that throw hard. Put them in the bullpen so that you have a guy coming in the sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning, and ninth inning. And then you use those pieces when their contracts come up to trade for a positional player. You build, you stockpile the young arms in your farm system. Kansas City Royals exhibit A. Mm -hmm. that, that's why they won. You know, they had all those young arms in there. They traded them. Um, you know, but the Yankees have done a decent job of that, as you can see with their bullpen. You know, they got uh, – I like Severino. I like um, – but Tansis, I like both yeah. of those. I just can't, bro. I, I'm sorry. I can't. Because we're used, we're used to the Yankees being. Yes, I, I, bro. I can't put, I can't put the word Yankees and rebuilding in the same sentence. I'm neither sorry. Sorry, bro. Neither can anyone else up here. Trust me. The Yankee fan can't understand that. I mean, I was having a conversation at a birthday party the other day, and guys like, well, yeah, I can't believe they didn't sign David Price. Well, they don't have the money. Uh oh. Those pictures up here, I know, because I miss up. Okay. Well, that, that's very nice. Maybe we'll try to contact her. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Bro, it, does Quinn have a poster of Reggie Jackson in her room? Can you go get Mr. October off the tree? Yeah. You think you can get him? Yeah. Nope. Bro, we're going to get Mr. October. We put him up last Bro, night. what do you listen to me? How old is young Quinn now, the beautiful young Quinn? Five. What do you tell her about Reggie Jackson? Like, do you sit her on your knee and tell her tales of Reggie Jackson? Bro, he's he. I have one of those fat heads in the man cave of Reggie Jackson. Oh. <laughs> Where were you able to find that, bro? Ah, uh, shit. I oh can't... my gosh. Remember, I can't remember. Bro, um, what about the Bronx is burning when Reggie says I start a drink, bro? The bro, bro, he hated that. He hated the Bronx is burning. How about when he called out Dick? How about when Dick Howes was like, "Yeah, Reggie, maybe you should be doing this," and he says, "Yeah, uh, Dick, what'd you hit?" <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's almost like who'd you ever beat bro, uh, that, bro why do you love reggie tell tell me put some sum it up to me why you love reggie so when i was younger growing Daddy, up in what's contact me that what's contact me contact yeah means to touch contact why he's the touch that's the Reggie tree on him, and bro, that 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 it, it's up right near the top, bro. That would be the angel on the top if it had a base, correct? Correct. Say, Mister October, don't touch. Mix October. That's yeah. unbelievable. Hey, go put him back on. Good job. Um, so my dad is a big Yankee fan. 
and my uncles were big Yankee fans. <clears throat> Yankees and Philadelphia A's. So my grandfather had season tickets to the Phillies, so I used to go to a lot of Philly. Bro, I saw Schmidt and Carlton. Yeah, unbelievable. I was, bro, I was 10 years old. I didn't know what I was seeing. Yeah. I, was, I, I remember telling my dad whenever Carlton pitched, I was like, man, this, this a lot of a lot of guys swing and missing. And my dad's like, yeah, he's really good. Yeah. So, my dad, so we used to go down to Memorial Stadium twice a year. We'd see the A's, Oakland A's, and we'd see the Yankees. So um, in 75, we went down, and I remember Reggie hit a monstrous home run against the Orioles. So then we go down in 76 to see the Orioles play the Yankees, and Reggie Jackson's playing for the Orioles now. <clears throat> so... You know, and he showed up late that year. The fans were booing him, but he's having a good year. I think he had 27 home runs, 90-something ribbies, hit like 280. So the fans are booing him because he said he's not signing. He knows he's going to be a free agent. Um, Finley trades him. I, he struck out three times. The game's tied. He comes up in the bottom of the ninth with one out. Strike one. Boo! Strike two. Boo! <laughs> Bomb. Still, bro, the ball may land. Daddy, it may land in Colorado. Can... Mommy, right? maybe we can go on. Daddy, maybe we can go on FaceTime. Well, we're kind of on it now. So the ball lands. Shh. So the ball lands. Bro, now do you, do you, do you, I, I hate to interrupt you, Pat, but like, do you put Quinn on your knee and and, and tell her this same story? Oh. All right, go I, ahead, bro. Go ahead. Okay, you got, you got and, me hooked now. The ball lands in center field, over the center field bleed. The old Memorial Stadium was awesome. Right. Lands over the center field bleachers. Reggie's trotting around. They're build, they're still building him, bro. They're still building him. He steps on home plate. He takes off his batting helmet and bows. <laughs> and bows. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the stands, bro. I'm eight years old. And I go, I want to be this guy. That's the guy I want to be. Bro, wh wh why is it that all of the greats had a huge set on him, bro? My God, bro. I'll never forget. I'll never forget him bowing. I'll never forget. Bro, look at, look at you. Bro, look, at, look at this, the beautiful <laughs> Quinn. We're going out to lunch today. We got to brush your teeth. Your Where are you going to lunch with you and the beautiful Quinn? No, we have. No, I have a. No, yeah, I want to talk. When you're done, I want to contact Brianna. Okay, when we're done, when I'm done, okay. How Tell we five minutes. Tell five minutes we'll be done. Okay, show me five. Show Vince five. What's five? Five. Nice. nice. <laughs> hey Pat, how come? How come Reg Reggie never went on to be a hitting coach for anybody? Did he? He's a he's a paid instructor though, roving instructor for the um, for the Yankees in the minor leagues. I heard he does. He like goes around to the um, like in spring training. Um, spring training, he goes down there. Then he goes down to uh, like they send him to different minor league affiliations. Yeah, um, he was in Trenton. I remember last year he was in Trenton. Yeah, bro. You know who was my uh, you know who was my Reggie as a kid, and I think you'll respect this. Mickey, Mickey Mantle. No, no, no. Giants. Uh, well, Willie McCovey. McCovey, bro. Bro, seriously, I know you're a Reggie guy, but was anybody more opposing than McCovey at the plate, bro? The only guy I would say would be Stargell, and I don't even think Stargell was as opposing as God, he was so freaking imposing. Same okay. number, 44. Unbelievable. Bro, bro think of the 44s. Reggie, McCovey, Aaron. Bro, when you talk to guys about the greatest of all time, how many people forget about Hank Aaron? Oh yeah, bro. So many people. So oh, many people. Oh god. Yeah. Hank Aaron. I mean, he's you know. Bro, forget does your wife tell you the lovely Candace? Does she tell you what my wife tells me like every day? You know what my wife tells me every single day? Grow up. Stop living in the past. Oh, she tells me all the time because all the music I listen to is from the eighties and all the you know. Um, I mean, sure. Bro, do you know every night here in Colorado, seven to eight, back-to-back -back episodes of oh. All in the Family? Bro. And I never miss one, and I sit there, I crack up, I cry, and my wife tells me, you, you need to stop living in the past. So, uh, genius. Absolute genius writing. Genius. Bro, forget it. You know what I say about that? Did anybody in the history of television to this day, have the facial expressions of Carol O'Connor, bro. One person. Who? John Ritter on Three's Company. That's a good one. Yeah, yes, bro. I, I, I agree. He would sell so, so, so awesome. Uh, bro, 
Archie Bunker, and you're going to disagree with me because you'll say Ralph Cramden, was the greatest character in television history. Bro, did you see what I got tattooed on my body? Yeah, Ralph Cramden. I got Ralph Cramden right here on the arm, bro. Bro, do you know who TV Guide voted the number one sitcom character of all time? It's either Ralph Cramden, Archie Bunker, or uh, De- who was Danny DeVito in Taxi? That was it. Louis De Palma, bro. Number one of all time. Bro, talk about a great show. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. But, I, bro, I still think All in the Family was better. If you remember back then, they would sweep the Emmys. Actor, yeah. actress, supporting actor, meathead, uh, act, supporting actress. They, sw- they swept. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It, was, it was genius. I mean, I watch it today. And I just, I'm dying of laughter. It's unbelievable. Bro, Bro, who was on Archie's place? What do you mean who was on there? What celebrity was on Archie's place? Oh, that's a good question, bro. I don't don't know. Remember he backed into his car? Reggie's. I never saw that, bro. Back into Reggie's car. Yeah, Archie backed into Reggie's car. I got to find that on YouTube. I never saw that. All right, listen, Pat, I've taken an hour and 15 minutes of your time. We got to take the lovely Quinn out to lunch today. She's got to get on FaceTime with Brianna. Your whole day is booked, bro. Your whole day is booked. Totally booked. Yeah. Totally. But I, I, I want. She is, cheer, is cheerleading tonight. And you got to take it to cheerleading. Four o'clock. Bro, do you watch Dance Moms? I've seen it. It's funny, bro. There's, oof. Bro, that stuff doesn't happen up here in the Northeast. You know that. What do that you mean? stuff. The, the, the wacky moms yeah. with the, the well, kids. Well, bro, you look- know what I love about Because I argue with my – yeah, I argue with my wife all the time. The, the the teacher, Abby, is really, really stiff with these kids. They make a – she makes the kids cry. She Like like your baseball coach, bro. She's like that. And my, my wife is always, oh, she's a bully. She's this. She's that. And you know what I say, Pat? And tell me because you, you experience this. I said, you know what? When these kids are 18 years old – 20 years old and women, they're going to appreciate what that woman did for her. Bro, here's, here, I'll never forget this. Um, in ECW, we wrestled at VCU. Probably one of the highlights of my career. Um, and before the show, I went by the baseball office and the assistant coach, the head coach at the time was the assistant when I played there, Paul Keyes, who died last year of cancer, um, who basically made VCU into a you know, yearly top 25 baseball program. So I went by to talk to him and he's like, here, let me show you the, you know, the facilities. Obviously it changed since I was in there. You know, our weight room was like the size of, you know, my office here. Um, so he showed me the facilities and we're talking. And I said, you know, coach, I, you know, and, and my coach, uh, Tony Guzzo had moved on to become the head coach of Old Dominion. Um, and I think now he's a, he's a, uh, Scout, he's like a regional director scouting for the Dodgers, I think. Anyway, so I said, you know, I I didn't understand why Coach Guzzo was so hard, but I think I do now. And he said, Pat, you got to remember this. Our jobs were based upon 18 to 22-year-old kids. Think about that. And I was like, hmm, yeah, good point. And that's what it is. It's, you know, these, you know, today's society, you can't, uh, I mean, well, I'm offended. Here comes this. Oh, forget it, bro. Forget it. Comes, you know, let's, you know, I'm going to hold a press conference. I was offended. Well, then don't listen. Now, now, Pat, how's the conversation with where you and Quinn are going to go for lunch? How does that work? Does she dictate? Do you work her and really go where you want to work? You work her. She, she's a worker. She's a total worker. She's she knows how to work the gimmick. I mean, she knows. <laughs> it's funny, man. It is funny. You know, she. Bro, do you know you're a father who just said, "My daughter knows how to work the gimmick." <laughs> she does. <laughs> so you're gonna. I don't want to go to, go to McDonald's. I'll steer steal steer her away from that with, um, either Chick Fil A because they have a play area there, or the Rainforest Cafe. Oh, you got one of those. Those are nice, bro. Expensive, yep. though, no, but a little pricey, bro. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Iris, thanks so much for the time today, bro. Good talking to you. Because people don't understand, too. It was like three hours for you to figure out how to use Skype before we could do the interview. It was 30 minutes. Yeah, it was 30 minutes. 
Pat, thanks so much, bro, for joining me here today. All right, bro. Don't go anywhere yet. I'm going to sign off. Then I want to say goodbye to you, all right? There you have it, everybody. The great Irish Pat Kenny, Simon Diamond. I hate that name. I will see you right here next week back on The Swerve. Thanks, everybody. Critically acclaimed producers Kayfabe Commentaries bring you the most candid shoot interview ever with Sabu, nephew of the legendary Sheik. Would your aunt be talking business of course. with the Sheik? Oh, yeah. And Carney. She can speak Carney better than That's me. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Prepare to explore the darkest corners of the man behind Sabu. I would have stopped pain pills entirely if I was out of pain. Because I've been a little too long at the dance myself. You feel now you've been too long at the dance. Breaking Kayfabe with Terry Sabu Brunk, now available on DVD and on demand at shootinterviews.com.